Aloff uh, has published many essays, interviews, and articles about culture for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Village Voice, and many other periodicals. She's been the dance critic for both The Nation and for The New Republic. She teaches dance criticism and writing at Barnard College. And a previous book, Dance Anecdotes, was published by Oxford University Press. Uh, she is the author, of course, of Hippo in a Tutu. And uh, I want to welcome Mindy Aloff today. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I hasten to add, we'll, we'll be um, showing lots of clips, which uh, Mindy will be commenting on. Uh, and those will be playing on the monitor over here and also over here so that you can situate yourself so that you can see everything. Um, and we'll be joined about halfway through the hour by Marge Champion. So um, first, though, talking about the book, uh, you're a serious dance critic. Uh, you've spent, <laughs> and yet you spent several years um, looking in, researching cartoons and Disney animation. Uh, certainly some of your peers in the dance world must have thought you had lost your mind. Uh, how, tell me about this um, journey. Well, that, that, it's very curious. Um, actually, Disney was interested in dancing from the very beginning, of, from the founding of his studio. Um, and I had written about an, uh, dancing and animation uh, in the, for The New Yorker. Um, I published a couple columns on it, actually. As you know, the 20th century was um, a century when film and dance kind of went hand in hand. And animation um, was important to film from the end of the 19th century in Russia, actually, with a, a wonderful dancer named Alexander Shuraev, who wanted to preserve the character dances of the Imperial Ballet. And he did it by stop motion animation. So um, uh, theatrical dancing and animation have had a very long connection. And you had done investigation then into this before the, before the book began. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I'd call it investigation <laughs> because I didn't know that much. Uh -huh. I, I simply went to every program that was offered in New York. And of course, there are abundant programs in New York City where you can see almost anything. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I, I made a lot of discoveries. Also, before then, The Village Voice, uh, my beloved editor at The Village Voice, the late Bert Supri, uh, sent me to a, um, to a festival of Warner Brothers cartoons at Film Forum, for those of you who know the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, repertory film theater in New York. And he expected me to write about dance in them. And after I sat through 100 cartoons in two days of Warner Brothers, I came out and thought, I really long to see Disney. I had grown up with Disney. Um, and it's not only the dancing, it's the music, uh, the Disney Studios, thanks basically to Roy Disney, the brother of uh, Walt Disney. The, uh, Roy Disney was. Um, devoted to the enterprise, and he was a good businessman. And without him, uh, the Disney uh, Disney simply would not have been able to succeed. It was Roy mm -hmm. Disney, really, who provided the the sustenance for mm -hmm. Disney to go forward. Um, thanks, thanks to to those people, dancing and music were given very high priority in terms of quality, and in terms of um, refinement of te technology, mm -hmm. how, they were, how they were coordinated and made. Well, we're really, uh, you, you sketch that out beautifully in the book, by the way. It's an absolutely terrific book. And uh, there's so much scholarship in it. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's kind of staggering to read uh, and learn as much as we can read uh, and learn from, this, from the book about the history of animation. And, some of what I, I've just selected some very quick uh, clips to show to sort of move us through the the years. But um, the first one is uh, Silly Symphony, uh, uh, the skeleton dance, which is one of the earliest. That's the first. Mm -hmm. 1929. The first of the Silly, Silly symphonies. symphonies. The Silly Symphonies, there were two units at the Disney studio in the late 20s and 30s. 
One of them uh, produced shorts that were character-driven, short films, short animated films, and the other were the silly symphonies that were music-driven, mm -hmm. and they did not have recurring characters. Consequently, the animators uh, and the there were many, many other people who worked on these films than the animators. There were hundreds of people, story men and every, um, were able to uh, explore uh, all kinds of, of ideas mm -hmm. that they couldn't in a character in the Mickey Mouse and then eventually Donald Duck where mm -hmm. the characters were um, uh, grounded the films. Mm -hmm. But so those had dancing too. Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse were both very good dancers. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we see some skeletons dancing. This is just about a minute clip from 1929. Interestingly, with the skeleton dance, and I think this is one of the, one of the ways in which the book has a very rich um, mingling of uh, animation stories, but also grounding in the classical dance world, uh, you make the connection that this film came out just a couple of years before before Kurt Yost created the figure of death in uh, the, his famous ballet, The Green, the Green Table. Table. There's real choreography here. Oh, there is real <laughs> choreography. I, I would like to um, give you the name of Ub Iwerks in particular, who was the animator for this and other silly symphonies. and the sole animator, that is, he did all the drawings, not only the poses, but the in-between drawings, except for one sequence with the xylophone. His assistant, Les Perkins, did that. Um, Ub Iwerks was a genius and invented Mickey Mouse also as a visual, um, uh, visual designer. What I find fascinating about this also is that um, we're seeing a lot of like distortion of the the, um, the you know the the elongation of the of the skeleton and this this kind of thing that happens also in some of the early Mickey Mouse things, which you write about in the book mm -hmm. about how this sort of uh, distortion was uh, more common maybe in the in the beginning. It was more common to all the studios. You know, there mm -hmm. were a number of animation studios. Um, people from New York might remember Fleischer, which was actually based here. And I grew up with Fleischer on television, as well as, as Disney. Um, and there was a lot of exploration. The ideas from Parisian surrealism had reached the United States, and they infiltrated all the arts. All the visual artists were aware of them. And the, uh, um, all of the animators and story people were very well versed in the history of art and they were quite interested in exploring those ideas mm -hmm. for a mass audience commercially. Mm -hmm. And that must be um, emphasized. They didn't have complete freedom. Mm -hmm. they ha the box office was key mm -hmm. because the box office was going to support the next film. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have grants. They didn't have a national endowment for the <laughs> arts. They didn't have foundations that now um, would yeah. support many of the artists. Well, I think it's interesting also to think, with, because of course we'll be speaking later with Marge about how uh, live action was incorporated and how then they became more lifelike, uh, oftentimes the, the, mm -hmm. the creations, the cartoon creations. But next we want to look at another short. Uh, this is Cock of the Walk from 1935. And you write in the book uh, for choreography, elegance, musicality, poetic ra resonance, and depth of reference, the silly symphony Cock of the Walk is one of the most stylish dance films the Disney studio ever released. <laughs> and you go on to mention that none <laughs> other than Lincoln Kirstein, the co-founder of the New York City Ballet, praised this film in a 1936 essay that he wrote on dance and films. Yes, he loved it. And he loved Disney. In fact, Balanchine and Stravinsky made a, di a visit to the Disney studio in 1939 as the studio was preparing Fantasia. They saw the Rite of Spring section being prepared. Mm. Um, uh, Cock of the Walk, uh, in 1935 when Cock of the Walk was uh, released, the Disney studio changed its distributor to RKO and RKO also was producing the hit series of Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers pictures. So you are going to hear, I hope in the sequence you picked, 
the Carioca, which came from an Astaire Rogers picture uh, called Flying Down to Rio. In fact, it was the first in their series. Mm -hmm. That's very unusual to have the rights to use music from another film for an animated short. Mm -hmm. And um, the visuals for uh, Cock of the Walk frequently are compared to Busby Berkeley. But I would suggest that anybody who knows Swing Time, a Nestor Rogers film that was in production when Cock of the Walk was being made, will perhaps see connections to the Pick, your, uh, pick Yourself Up, Dust mm -hmm. Yourself Off mm -hmm. um, number that, they, that Fred and Ginger do in the dance studio in mm -hmm. Swing Time. Um, in this case, it's being done by um, uh, uh, two uh, uh, barnyard uh, dancers yeah. uh, on a traveling, uh, it, which is actually a traveling, um, what do you call it? Boxing, boxing ring. A boxing ring. Petunia Pullet? Is Petunia, that a, uh, the, uh, Prunella. Prunella, Prunella Pullet. Pullet. Uh -huh. See, that's straight from the karaoke, head to head. And that's invented by Disney. And this is from Dave Gould's choreography for the karaoke, that particular lifting of the skirt. That is from Swing Time, mm. Pick Yourself Up, where they jump over um, uh, together. That's right. That actually is from Roberta. <laughs> and what's and that? That <laughs> is from the brains of the Disney crew. <laughs> here comes the uh, here come the dancing chicks, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Disney Studio was uh, always innovating and always mm -hmm. coming up with new ways of doing things and. There's an example in the Three Caballeros, which mm -hmm. was something that was new to me, I have to say, but, uh, but seeing this, um, this mixture of live action and animated uh, figures in 1944, this was, mm -hmm. Um, and you refer to, uh, to, to it as a, a tour of South America from inside the unregulated brain of Donald Duck. <laughs> uh, everyone dances constantly. And, uh, and this, this uh, is only about a, a minute and a half a segment from it, but it's, it's very interesting and it shows, it's the choreography of Carmelita Maraci, mm -hmm. the, the live action part of it yes. is Carmelita yes. Maraci. Who was a wonderful teacher in California also. And I think it's before Gene Kelly with Jerry Mouse and Anchors Away. Yeah, I think you're right. Which is the most famous live action um, cartoon from the dance from the 40s. <laughs> So we've looked at things from the 20s, 30s, and, and now 40s, and of course we'll circle back uh, to some things from, from that time period with Marge, but I want to move on to, uh, in the 1950s, uh, an, uh, an effort with, with Goofy, which actually gets pride of place on the back cover of the book. Um, there is a photograph of Goofy from How to Dance and uh, a, a beautiful rendering of some of the dance diagrams there. And w to quote from it, you, you say, over the course of many decades of devoted effort, Disney's animators learned something Goofy never quite could, to comprehend the crucial distinction between dancing and choreography and to master them both. That's, <laughs> that, well, that's quite a statement. Well, in the 19, that's, but isn't that the subject of the art? Um, mm -hmm. In the 1950s, which is when I was growing up, there were a lot of books about how to dance. The idea was that you could learn from a book. You could also, of course, go to Arthur Murray or the Fred Astaire Studios mm -hmm. or various, various other. But there was this optimism that one could <laughs> learn how to dance from a book. You couldn't actually learn how to dance that way, but you could learn what the steps were in space. And um, in fact, mm -hmm. this film was uh, released in 1953. 
In 1952, I happened, as, as I happened to discover, there was a book called How to Dance that was uh, published right here in New York from Garden City. It was a reprint of a 1942 book, and it had in the back not only the diagrams of where you should go for the rumba, the cha-cha-cha, and the samba, but it had cutouts of footprints that you then put on the ground <laughs> and tried, you put on the radio or your Victrola and you tried to match your feet by yourself in your room <laughs> from the book. And well, that is what That's um, very much Goofy what Goofy is doing here. Do. So, so what I also love about this, uh, we're only again going to see uh, about a two minute excerpt from it, but even within these two minute excerpts, you get a little, um, a uh, history of dance. A history of dance around the world. Yeah. The, the uh, Firehouse Five was a uh, band, a studio band. Dancing has always been man's way of expressing his emotions. A little bit more. He danced to bring the rains. <laughs> he danced to frighten evil spirits. To bring in his crops. Tribal tales were told with the slightest movement of the hands. The dance has always had its romantic aspects. Even today, dancing is still enjoyed by many, but there are those who have become so inhibited they no longer have the ability or instinct to dance away their cares. Come on, George, let's dance. Mm -mm. Are you forced to offer some feeble excuse for not dancing? <laughs> Are you left holding the bags and stuck with the check while others enjoy themselves? Do you have two left feet? Of course. Do you feel like a wallflower <laughs> alone in a world of laughter and dancing feet? Well, you can learn to dance. All do it. Dancing is as easy as one, two, three, and A, B, C. Example. A being the right foot is placed at numeral one. B the left foot at numeral two. Now C equals motion, therefore A or the right foot if the student is a lady, or B the left foot if you're a man glides to numeral three. Logically, of course, the right foot follows the left and vice versa into the simple patterns that follow. And that's choreography. Right? Yeah. <laughs> As a way of bringing Marge Champion into the conversation, I want to show a little bit of the importance of the live action model and what, uh, what the live action model really achieved in terms of the Disney films. What we're going to look at is just a minute from uh, one of the silly symphonies called Goddess of Spring, mm -hmm. uh, 1934 it was. And um, you, uh, well, it's, it's like a mini operetta, this, this, yes, uh, th is. this cartoon. And it has a Persephone figure who is introduced uh, as an Isadora-like dancer. And you write, we can immediately see the anatomical difficulties that the animator had with the figure. The arms have no elbows. The head is uncertainly <laughs> affixed to the throat. The shoulders don't align. And I think in this minute-long clip, you really can see uh, that, that it was Im an imperfectly drawn um, dancing figure. But Even there were two references for it. One, an a another animator in the studio, mm -hmm. and one, the wife of an animator, mm -hmm. but not on film. Neither they of them had, had elbows, apparently. <laughs> well, no, it was done from <laughs> memory of oh, how they... Oh, uh-huh. And those um, particular little leaps are associated with Isadora Duncan. Right. The for going forward and then the, the release. And then, of course, we do have dancing flowers also that appear here, um, but also different because those are not really anatomically correct flowers either. No, and, yeah. no but they have probably attended a Siegfeld matinee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what I want to show next is uh, then how this developed, um, uh, just before we bring Marge up, to see then um, what was achieved in Snow White and how different this is as a dancing figure from, now mm. look at the dancing here. There are elbows. 
And there are steps. There are steps. And there's phrasing. Yes. And there's beautiful um, epaulement and port de bras. With that, I would like to welcome up to the stage Marge Champion. I want first, before we uh, talk a little bit more about the films, uh, I promised the audience that we would tell them about this chair that you're sitting in. And uh, I wonder if you would tell us that story. Yes, I will. It uh, is a chair that my father designed and had built in be this beautiful oak. And he sat looking at the mirror, and his pupil uh, would sit, if they were doing the right side, they'd stand on this side, if they were doing the left side. And the demonstrator, usually me, at the age of 12 or 13, would be on the other side. And we all three could look in the mirror, and my father could correct them. So this was the reason for the teacher's chair. He also used it to, uh, uh, in the center of the room, when he had large classes, and he'd have uh, three assistants on each side mm. of this, so that the dancers who were all around the room on the bar could uh, follow their um, technique. And your father was Ernest Belcher. Yes. Who was? He was the dean of the West Coast Dance, and he was also the first dance director I think, or one of the first in motion pictures. He also uh, uh, did dances for sometimes Charlie Chaplin. The Chaplin Studios were right near, near where we lived in Hollywood. And uh, he would go over and help him with some kind of movement because he wanted it to look a little more dance-like. Mm. It always look, looked cartoonish. Mm -hmm. You might even say an animation-ish. One of the reasons that I wanted to um, have the chair here and kind of make this connection with your father was that I had al always assumed that given his stature in the dance field and in, the, the, in movies and so forth, that of course that would have been the reason that you had ended up as a live action model for Disney. But I understand there was a talent search. That yes. They, uh, I was told that they auditioned over 200 girls. Uh, the talent scout came to my father's school because uh, that's where they were looking for. I, I was 13 when I, when I auditioned for it. And of course, over the summer into September, which is now coming up, my uh, 91st birthday is uh, September 2nd. So I had gone back to school, but this time to Hollywood High. And my, uh, he, I had heard in, in March, or I th think that I would, I auditioned in it, mm. and uh, for it, and I didn't hear all summer long. I'd forgotten all about it, and suddenly I get a call from the studio, uh, driver over to get measured for a costume, <laughs> which was wonderful because uh, then I had to find out what an improvisation was. And uh, I had a wonderful high school drama teacher, Mr. Cachel at Hollywood High, who made me do some really silly improv things in front of the class, uh, mostly um, football, football players, players who were just uh, thought it was an easy class to do. And <laughs> it was very embarrassing. I was picking daisies and doing all kinds of things, but it got me over any kind of uh, you know, shyness. Shyness mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. self-awareness. And, mm -hmm. and so when they'd show me a storyboard, I, uh, I just do anything. I mean, mm -hmm. I made it up as I went along. Mm. And if they didn't like it, they would have me do it again. Or mm -hmm. I always, when, uh, when the scene was with any of the dwarves, they always had somebody on his hands and knees <laughs> practically dancing mm. down there so my eye line would be right. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Ham Lusk was the director of mm -hmm. so many of my uh, scenes, and of course, Anna, uh, 
Oh, the, the voice? Yes, uh, the voice. Of Snow White. Yes, yeah. uh, she uh, had done all of the sound. Mm -hmm. And so I had to mouth uh, to her. Mm -hmm. um, to her recordings. Th her recordings, mm -hmm. yes. Well, the, the first, I, <clears throat> I have a little clip. It's only about 20 seconds. It's from one of the, some of the bonus material for the latest DVD of Snow White. Marge Champion as Snow White seeing her dance because she was a dancer and seeing her move and seeing her interact with the dwarves who were played by various people there at the studio and they shot that live action and they used it as a guide the voice on that uh, one it's it was from a, a a documentary called animating art and when i was just before I was 18, I was married to Art Babbitt, who also was one of their animators. He did the mushroom dance in uh, Fantasia. Fantasia. In Fantasia. He loved dancing and also dancers. I was not his first wife, <laughs> <laughs> nor his last. <laughs> In between, he married somebody who didn't dance, but then he married Barbara Perry, and uh, she called me one day because she had uh, been on our television show when we had the Margin Gower Champion show, and uh, we knew her also danced for, uh, in, uh, up in um, Las Vegas. Uh -huh. Wonderful tap dancer, her mother had, and she called me one day and she said, I've gone and done something really interesting. I said, what? I married your old husband. <laughs> <laughs> so that, then we all became friends. <laughs> well, that's very modern of you, Marge. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I wonder, how much time did you actually spend doing the modeling? I mean, what, what kind of a schedule were you on? A uh, well, I spent about two years, mm -hmm. I think, or maybe a year and a half. Uh, but only one or two days a month, right? Because I could do enough in mm -hmm. that short period to uh, uh, to keep them busy for uh, doing yeah. uh, doing the drawings. Yeah, they and would film you. They would they film you. us, film me on sixteen millimeter. Mm -hmm. Then it would go to a rotoscoper, who is, that's a euphemist from somebody who traces. He would trace every film. And then it was get presented to the uh, animator who was assigned to that particular mm -hmm. section. And he could take uh, what he wanted. It was a guide for his action. Mm -hmm. But it actually was, in a sense, tracing. Tracing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was the thing that Mr. Disney never wanted to talk about. He's and not so here. It's OK. <laughs> you can say, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> As an introduction to getting to our title character of Hippo in a Tutu, um, I want to first show a little bit, uh, just a snippet from Goldwyn Follies, because I understand that the, the water nymph ballet from Goldwyn Follies, which was choreographed by George Balanchine for his wife, Vera Zarina. Brigitte. Oh. Everybody she, called her Brigitte. Oh, Brigitta. sorry. Oh, I didn't know her. But, but her <laughs> name was actually Vera Zarina. Yeah. And uh, you had seen the film and in the 30s. Yes, it was 1930, uh, uh, Goldwyn Follies of 1936, I think. And I, she came up out of a pool. And by then, I was you know, so cheeky with them that I, I ran back, because I was working on the tutu. And I said, you've got to see what, you've got to see what she does. That's what the, the, that's what she should be doing in the in the movie. Mm -hmm. So they go, they showed the movie to the animators, and sure enough, they bought the idea. So let's just see a couple a minute, really, from Goldwyn Follies. This is Vera Zarina about to come out of the pool here. This is called the Undine Ballet from the character of Undine in the Water. But it's interesting, when even the columns and the setting was reproduced in Fantasia. Yes,
And even though she's barefoot here, she really was a ballerina, right? Yes. yes. And she was Balanchine's wife. Right. And of course, I caricatured this. Right, You'll which see. we'll see. I don't know if you have that. Yeah. In this, um, we see really a montage here of uh, some, a mixture of the film as well as some of your modeling for Fantasia. Yeah. So here you are in the modeling for it. <laughs> and there's the pool. I was caricaturing yeah. Zarina. Yeah. Well, I see some hand gestures there that are not so dissimilar. <laughs> and then this is some of the this, ostrich. This yeah. is the ostrich. They gave me, we did a, and Louis Hightower is in this now, because uh, they made us wear bathing suits so they could get the line mm. of the, I think it's the story. Here, here's, yeah. there she is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then now, now this is the uh, Louis Hightower modeled for yes. the alligator. Alligator. Mm -hmm. And you'll see they reversed mm -hmm. what we actually did. When in doubt, you will see. He was wonderful. He did wonderful. He was a great dancer. Wonderful dancer. He was a really wonderful. one of my very first partners. He studied with my father. And we get to see Marge on point here. Oh yes. <laughs> that stopped very early. <laughs> See yeah, Andre Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> when in doubt, do that. <laughs> and then these were students from your father's school? Yes, the Dance of the Hours. And uh, he had 11 people, and I was in it myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted to see how it would look if they had the elephants or or uh, you know doing this so mm -hmm. a lot of girls who were having a lot of fun just like <laughs> I, was. I never called it choreography but it it turned out to be the essence of the way we moved, we moved or it. something like mm -hmm. that well, I want to make sure that we have time for um, some signing of books, which is going to be happening in the back corner back there. But I think uh, that we need a little musical finish to today's, uh, and you gave allusions to something that's coming up this week, your 91st birthday. So I'd like to have everybody join me in singing, yeah. Happy <laughs> birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.